as we get those fine details completely worked out. But just uh, be keeping an eye out for that. We'll send you some information on that this week and be, uh, be praying about um, how you might be involved in our Sunday school program uh, moving forward. That being said, let's, let's move on into our service this morning and let's begin by praying together. Holy Father, we bow before you now and we thank you um, for this opportunity to address you in prayer. We thank you for this time that we can come before you and share our, our hopes and our concerns, share our desires. Father, we, we pray that you will be with us and lift us up in our times of need, Father. Help us to know that you're always there and always with us. Help us to know that there's nothing that can be done without you in our lives. Father, this morning we are um, especially mindful of, um, of all of our mothers. Uh, we celebrate these women today. Um, Father, we're mindful that this is, uh, for, for some, a, a day of celebration and for some, a day of grieving. We pray that you be with, um, with all of those women. We pray for um, those mothers that have uh, given birth and, and serve as uh, biological mothers. We, we pray for those who um, have stepped in in times of need and, and become adoptive mothers. We pray for those mothers today that are uh, doing this by themselves and serving as, as single mothers. Father, we pray for those fathers who are uh, serving as single fathers and having to uh, serve both the role of father and mother. Father, we pray for uh, our grandmothers and our great-grandmothers. Father, we pray for our aunts and our sisters, for those women who are, are serving as guardians, for those women who are, are grieving now because they've lost a child. We pray for all those who are grieving because they've lost their mother. And Father, we pray also for those women who have that, tr that strong desire to be a mother and for one reason or another have been unable to do so. Father, ultimately, we, we thank you for the women in our lives. And we pray your, your greatest blessing upon each one of them as they've been a blessing to us. Father, we, we thank you for this time that we can dive into your word and, and uh, see a message um, about some of the strong women that you've put in, in the life of your scripture. And Father, I pray that you uh, use me today to share your word in a way that will shine light on you. Father, we love you so much. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. This morning, as we celebrate um, all of the godly women in our lives and, and recognize the special gift from God that, uh, that they are, um, I want to use our lesson time this morning to draw our attention to a rather impressive woman and a mother that's found in Scripture. This is a woman whose importance and story oftentimes gets overlooked as we read through the pages of our Bibles. Her story really is treated more as, as a footnote to a more well-known story. But really, her role in, in the story of the history of God's people is incredibly important. As a, matter of, as a matter of fact, I believe her situation is one that may be very relatable to many women today, and her example and her influence— need to be honored, and need to be imitated by both women and men alike. As pertaining to motherhood, she experienced many of the ups and downs that maybe many of you have faced. Most of her life, she longed for a child, but she was unable to conceive. The point had come in her life where she probably had come to terms with the fact that she may never have a child. She probably looked upon other families wishing that she could experience that same joy as they played with their own children. Maybe she was preparing herself for an influential role model in the lives of the children of some of her friends and relatives. On top of being childless, something else that you women might relate to is that she had a husband that wasn't always the quickest to pick up on things. He wasn't always the sharpest tool in the shed and she would occasionally have to explain some things to him. Then, not to get too far ahead of you and, and ruin the story for you, but she eventually does get pregnant. But it wasn't necessarily the easiest pregnancy for her. She was put on this special diet. But eventually she would have a child. She would have a, a son, in fact. And while he was a good boy, 
He did a few things, and he made a few decisions that, quite honestly, probably added a few extra gray hairs to this mom's head. Yes, this was a, a woman of tremendous character, a woman of tremendous patience, and a woman of tremendous faith. She was a, a woman worthy of honor and emulation, and for all that honor and for all of the respect that she's due, I can't even tell you her name. You may have thought that I was talking about Sarah, the wife of Abraham and the mother of Isaac. Her story is, is, is very similar, and she too obviously is worthy of, of honor and respect, but I'm talking about another woman this morning that we want to uh, pay special close attention to. This is, a, this is a woman whose story you may not even know. Like I said, her story is treated more like a, a footnote in Scripture. We know the story of her son quite well. And even when we hear mention of her son, the woman, uh, this woman is not the first woman that comes to mind in, in his life. There's another woman that, that comes to mind. But certainly his mother, this godly woman, was one of the most important and one of the most influential women in his life. And without this woman, the story and the history of God's people would be very different. Now I want to introduce this woman to you. But honestly, I struggle with how to do that. Certainly she had a name, but we're not given it in the Bible. Her story is, well, it's just that. It's her story, not somebody else's. It's her story. She's not a footnote. She's not an extra in the story of someone else. She deserves to be known for who she is, not for who she's related to. But honestly, I don't even know the best way to do this. So I got thinking about it, and I thought about my mother. My mother was one of the most wonderful, one of the most influential people that you could ever know. She continues to be one of the most influential people in, in, in my life today, and, and she, she had a name. Her name was Carolyn Sue Walker. That's who she was, and I was proud to have her as my mother. But you know what else I know? She was proud to have me as a son. She was proud to have my brother and, and my sister as her children. She was, she was proud to be the wife of my father. And so she didn't consider it a slight to her, but rather it was something she was proud of, to be known as Stephen's mom or Kevin's mom, or Jennifer's mom, or, or Richard's wife. She would be just as happy, if not more so, if you just knew her as Avery's Grammy, or Macy's Grammy. And even within the Point Pleasant soccer community, she was known affectionately as just simply Mama Walker. And so you could call her Carolyn, but she was just as happy if you knew her simply as Stephen's mom, or Richard's wife, or Avery's Grammy. And so as I think about this unnamed woman that we want to honor this morning, I figure, as most moms would, she would be proud for me to introduce, to you her, uh, introduce her to you this morning as simply so-and-so's mom. So this morning, I want you to turn in your pages of your Bibles to Judges chapter 13 and look at this wonderful story of the woman we know simply as Samson's mom. Before we jump into the story, I want to set the scene for you. The central story of the Old Testament is God rescuing his people out of Egyptian bondage and delivering them into the promised land. Moses had led the Israelites as they wandered through the wilderness for 40 years. Eventually, Moses dies and Joshua takes over, and he leads the Israelites into the promised land uh, and through many battles to conquer it. And then Joshua and all of his generation would eventually die. And all, after all this generation died, Judges chapter 2, verses 10 through 12 tells us there arose another generation after them who did not know the Lord or the work that he had done for Israel. And the people of Israel did what was evil in the sight of the Lord, and they served the Baals, and they abandoned the Lord, the God of their fathers, who had brought them out of the land of Egypt. The people of Israel had experienced strong leadership through Moses and, and Joshua for many years. And now that leadership is gone, and they're abandoning everything that they've ever known, and they're going after other gods. And obviously, this was displeasing to God, and he allowed for his people to be overtaken by various enemies. And after some time, God eventually installed judges to save his people, and it would work for a while. 
Chapter 2, verse 16 says, Then the Lord raised up judges who saved them out of the hands of those who plundered them. But a few verses later, we read that this time of renewal had a lifespan to it. It says, Whenever the Lord raised up judges for them, the Lord was with the judge, and he saved them from the hand of their enemies all the days of the judge. For the Lord was moved to pity by their groaning because of those who afflicted and oppressed them. But whenever the judge died, they turned back and were more corrupt than their fathers, going after other gods, serving them and bowing down to them. They did not drop any of their practices or their stubborn ways. This is the cycle that the Israelites are experiencing. They forget about God, and they chase after other gods. Life gets incredibly difficult for them. They cry out to God for help. God raises up a judge over Israel to save them. Things go well for a while, then the judge dies. And Israel reverts back to their old ways, to chasing after other gods. And the cycle just continues over and over and over again. This is the cycle through 11 judges. Finally, God raises up a judge that will begin the process of delivering his people from oppression, especially from the Philistines, once and for all. And this judge's name is Samson. But for Samson to be successful in defeating the Philistines, the circumstances needed to be just right. And that includes making sure that Samson was brought up in the right household by the right mother. And so let's pick up her story in Judges chapter 13, verse 1. It says, And the people of Israel again did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. So the Lord gave them into the hand of the Philistines for 40 years. Israel is again showing themselves to be unfaithful, and they're now in the part of that cycle that finds them being oppressed by the Philistines, this time for the past 40 years. For many of the Israelites at this point, this is all they've ever known. And what they need need now is not just another judge, but they need one that will put an end to it. They need one that will have a divinely provided birth. Judges 13, verse 2, picks up and tells us, There was a certain man of Zorah, of the tribe of the Danites, whose name was Manoah. And his wife was barren and had no children. This writer picks up and tells us about this couple from the town called Zorah. The man's name is Manoah, and his wife remains unnamed. All we know about her is that she is barren. The writer gives gives this added emphasis by saying that she was barren and she had no children. She had never been pregnant nor was she ever going to get pregnant. And if by chance she ever did find herself getting pregnant, it would only be by the hand of God. And wouldn't you know, that's exactly what would happen. Judges 13, verses 3 through 5 says, And the angel of the Lord appeared to the woman and said to her, Behold, you are barren and have not born children. But you shall conceive and bear a son. Therefore be careful and drink no wine or strong drink, and eat nothing unclean. For behold, you shall conceive and bear a son. No razor shall come upon his head, for the child shall be a Nazarite to God from the womb. And he shall begin to save Israel from the the hand of the Philistines. This physical manifestation of God appears to Manoah's wife. And he brings her the joyous news that she's been waiting on for her entire life. The news that, uh, that she had, had given up on ever receiving, she was going to become pregnant with a son. And beyond that, this son was going to begin the process. He was going to begin saving Israel from the Philistines. However, this news came with some special instructions, both for her during her pregnancy and for her son throughout his life. Even from the womb, this boy was to live under the Nazarite vow, separating him for God's purposes. Now, I want to make a side note here. This is just an extra for you. But the prohibitions on Samson's mother while she was pregnant with Samson would not be necessary if Samson's life began at the time of his birth. Clearly, God sees Samson's life, and by extension, all life, as beginning inside the womb. That's extra for you. Do with that what you will. So Samson's mother is not to drink alcohol or or eat anything unclean. And Samson's not to to cut his hair. The full details of of the Nazarite vow can be found in in Numbers chapter 6 if you want to go and read that later. Samson's not to go near any alcohol or anything produced on the grapevine. He's not to cut his hair, 
and he's not to go near a dead body. Now, this is a, a bit of an unconventional Nazarite vow for three reasons. One, a Nazarite vow was to be voluntary, but Samson's is assigned to him. Two, it was supposed to be for a temporary amount of time, but Samson's was to be for his whole life. And three, Samson would at various times break all the conditions of this Nazarite vow. But let's get back to Samson's mother. Her story is incredible. Because without her story, you don't have Samson's story. And her story is, is important. Her story is, is intentional. Because we have to understand that God did not just choose any woman that, uh, to be the mother of the judge that would begin to deliver his people from the Philistines. He needed someone who would be faithful to these very specific instructions. And so God finds this family from the tribe of Dan, not the most prominent tribe in all of Israel. They live in the town of Zorah, which is just a small town. Now, it is very strategically located on the edge of the Philistine territory, but it's a small town. And he finds the woman that he has handpicked to raise this final judge for him. He could have picked any woman. He could have used any woman who was physically capable already of conceiving a child. But he didn't want just any woman. This specific woman was who God wanted. And so he sends his angel to announce the news to her. Now this is significant also because Jewish tradition placed child rearing on, on both parents. But the angel doesn't appear to Manoah. The angel goes to Manoah's wife. She's the one that God is going to work through. She's the one that God knows he can count on to be faithful. And the angel announces the news to her, and she races to tell her husband. And I love what she says here. She races to her husband, and she says, A man of God came to me, and his appearance was like the appearance of the angel of God. Very awesome. I did not ask him where he was from, and he did not tell me his name. Her words to Manoah are evidence of her great faith in God. She didn't ask who he was. She didn't ask where he was from. She didn't ask for his name. But she knew that this was more than just a mere man. Rather, this was the angel of God. And she said he was very awesome, meaning his presence inspired both fear and reverence. Now, this is... is I think significant to me because she is living in a nation of people that haven't had anything to do with God for the past 40 years. And with all of that going on, nobody mentioning God for anything, here was a woman that was able to recognize the presence of God and understand that this was nothing less than something very awesome. This is the woman that God is looking to be faithful to him. This is the woman who God has been looking for to faithfully raise his judge. Now, this story continues to, to the end of the chapter, and then the focus kind of shifts onto Samson. And for the sake of time, I, I don't want to break down every verse for us. But I do believe this is an important story, one that we need to hear, one that's worth uh, reading and understanding. So I'm going to keep it simple today. What we're going to do is I'm going to read the rest of the story, and I'm going to make just a few quick comments here and there. And then I'm going to draw it all together for us at the end. So let's pick up verse 8. Of Judges 13. It says, Then Manoah prayed to the Lord and said, O oh Lord, please let the man of God whom you sent uh, come again to us and teach us what we are to do with the child who will be born. Manoah is apparently a little bit slow to understand everything that's going on here. So he requests that this messenger come back and, hey, listen, can you explain this to me too? It says, And God listened to the voice of Manoah, and the angel of God came once again, not to Manoah, even though he's the one who prayed the prayer, but again to the woman as she sat, on the, uh, sat in the field. But Manoah, her husband, was not with her, so the woman ran quickly and told her husband, Behold, the man who came to me the other day has appeared to me. And Manoah ro arose and went after his wife and came to the man and said to him, Are you the man who spoke to this woman? And he said, I am. And Manoah said, Now when your words come true, what is to be the child's manner of life? And what is his mission? Manoah's earlier prayer and, and his question uh, right now are, are really great things for parents to pray to God. But in this case, Manoah would have just done well to listen to his wife, since God had already informed her of these things. It says, And the angel of the Lord said to Manoah, Manoah, Of all that I said to the woman, 
let her be careful. Translation, dude, listen to your wife. She may not eat of anything that comes from the vine, neither let her drink wine nor, uh, or strong drink, or eat any unclean thing. All that I commanded her, let her observe. The angel tells Manoah, you should probably just let your wife take care of this one. Manoah said to the angel of the Lord, please let us detain you and prepare a young goat for you. And the angel of the Lord said to Manoah, if you detain me, I will not eat of your food, but if you prepare a burnt offering, then offer it to the Lord. For Manoah did not know that he was the angel of the Lord. Like I said, Manoah is a little bit slow to, to catch on to some of these things. And Manoah said to the angel of the Lord, what is your name? So that when your words come true, we may honor you. And the angel of the Lord said to him, why do you ask my name, seeing it is wonderful? So Manoah took the young goat with the grain offering and offered it on the rock to the Lord, to the one who works the wonders. And Manoah and his wife were watching. And when the flame went up toward heaven from the altar, the angel of the Lord went up in the flame of the altar. Now Manoah and his wife were watching, and they fell on their faces to the ground. And then the angel of the Lord appeared no more to Manoah and to his wife. Then, then Manoah knew that he was the angel of the Lord. I want you to notice that Manoah's wife knew that this was the angel of the Lord by his very first appearance earlier, by the very first encounter, but Manoah doesn't understand this until the angel's taken up in the fire. And Manoah said to his wife, we shall surely die, for we have seen God. But his wife said to him, if the Lord had meant to kill us, he would not have accepted a burnt offering and grain offering at our hands or shown us all these things or now announced to us such things as these. Manoah does kind of show here a, a healthy fear and a, a reverence of God, but here's the main thing I want us to notice. It's his wife, it, it's, it's Samson's mother that understands that all of this has been for a reason. God has been calling them to this great and this wondrous task. And while her husband's worried about dying, She's worried about being faithful. She's going to be nothing less than faithful. It says, And the woman bore a son and called his name Samson. And the young man grew, and the Lord blessed him. And the Spirit of the Lord began to stir him in Mahayanadan between Zora and Eshtael. I love this story. It's a wonderful story of a great heroine of the Bible. She was a great mother, and she was a great woman of faith. And unfortunately, like so many other mothers, she has not always received the recognition that she deserves. And while we may not know her name, and maybe we can't find it written in the pages of the Bible, I feel quite certain that you can find her name written in the Lamb's Book of Life. Praise God for this great woman, this great mother, this great woman of faith, this great woman of God. And so today, as we look at her story and we celebrate our, our own mothers, as we celebrate women of faith, I, I want to just simply challenge us to have the same type of faith and faithfulness of this, this great and wonderful woman. I challenge us all to have eyes that recognize the awesome power and presence like Samson's mom was able to do. I, I still find that incredible that for 40 years, they haven't had anything to do with God, and suddenly God's there. Manoah's wife says, Samson's mom says, that's him. I know him. I see him. That's great faith. I challenge us all to, uh, to have this same faith of this wonderful woman to know that if God is calling us to do something, then he's not going to be held back by our own physical lim limitations. Samson's mom could have just simply looked at this angel and said, listen, you said it yourself. I'm, uh, I'm, I'm barren. I can't bear any, any children. How, how in the world could this ever happen? She could have doubted what was going on here, but yet she said, you are God, and I'm your servant. I think that's a wonderful example for us to, to follow. If God is calling us to it, he's not going to be limited by what we think we can do. All we have to do is give ourselves over to his power and to his purpose. And this morning, I thank God for sharing this woman's story as an example for all of us in this. And I want to challenge us also to be a little extra attentive in recognizing and following the examples of the godly mothers and all of the women of faith that grace our lives every day. 
And so to all of you women, we honor you and we thank you. And so let's take a moment one more time uh, uh, to thank our mothers, but, but not just those women who have been given that special task of raising children. Let's thank God for all of these women who have answered his greater call to be faithful servants in his kingdom. And may we all be motivated by their example. Let's pray together. Holy Father, we come to you now and we thank you that as we read through the pages of Scripture, we find the example of many women who have gone before us to show us how to live as faithful servants to you. And Father, we thank you that when we come into, the, uh, come into this building and we're surrounded by our sisters, we thank you that we find the example of many women who are faithful servants to you. Father, we thank you for those women who you've called to, to raise children. We thank you for those who have that desire and who will one day uh, be able to do so. We thank you for those who maybe have not been able to do that uh, on, their, on their own, but are taking that step and uh, raising those that they have not actually given birth to. Father, we thank you for all women. We thank you that in your infinite wisdom, when you saw that the man you had created was alone, you, you found the, the perfect person, the perfect one to, uh, to complete him, to give him the, uh, the help to be equal with him. We thank you that you gave him woman. And so, Father, we thank you for all of these wonderful women in our lives today. We love you so much, Father, and it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Like I said, this wonderful woman gives us an example of what it's like to answer the call of God when he calls us to do something and for, for us to step forward in faith. And so this morning, we offer an invitation to do that very thing, to know that God is calling us to be his servant by putting him on in baptism and living as, as a child, but also as a servant. And we, we encourage you to have that same type of faith that's willing to step out and say, God, I'm yours. Use me in whatever way you see fit. And so if we can help you this morning, if you need to put Christ on in baptism, if you need prayers, whatever it may be, we ask that you come forward now as we